Good morning. Welcome to our Facebook Live program today. We're glad to have you with us. If you're joining us live, we're just so thankful you're a part of this broadcast this morning. And uh, you know, It's an exciting day today. It's Father's Day. We get to celebrate fatherhood. And you know what? There's none better than our Heavenly Father. In fact, I, I often on Father's Day reflect on who He is to me and what He's done for me. And I uh, I'm just so thankful that we've got a Heavenly Father. You know, he, He's the ideal, and it's kind of interesting. It, it can be really intimidating when you understand that that we that are earthly fathers uh, have such big shoes to fill. <laughs> it's not that we could ever be God. Uh, but, you know, we're called to be a reflection of our Heavenly Father to those that we love and those who depend upon us. And that's a tall order to fill. It's no wonder we find that we often fall short. But you know what? Uh, even though you may not reach perfection next week, <laughs> don't quit. Don't give up. Because we probably see more of the Lord in you and more of the Father in you than you've seen in yourself yet. And we appreciate you for that. Amen. Uh, tell you what, we're just so glad for your successes. And we're not going to capitalize on your failures any more than you would. You know, we would want you to capitalize on our failures. Over in Ephesians chapter 3, I, I love this, Paul was speaking, and you know, it's kind of interesting when you think about what I'm about to share, because Jesus at one point was talking to the Pharisees, in fact it was over in John's Gospel chapter 10, and he was re referencing God as his Father, and they took up stones to stone him. They said that by calling God his Father, he made himself equal with God. Well, what does it mean that God the Father has called us his sons? Behold what manner of love, we're told in 1 John, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Doesn't yet look like it sometimes, but it doesn't negate the fact that we are his sons and daughters by the new birth. Amen. Well, Paul made this statement. He said in verse 14 of chapter 3 in Ephesians, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Glory to God. You know what? Maybe you didn't have the best relationship with your natural father, but you've got a heavenly father that loves you more than life itself. In fact, he gave his life. He gave his son to, to ransom you from death and destruction. That's how precious you are to him. And he's got faith in you. You know, it's kind of interesting. God the Father has a good track record as our Heavenly Father. When He had every excuse and reason to wash His hands of humanity, He stayed right there faithful and, and continued to work His plan for humanity's redemption. Back in the garden, when He could have just walked away, when Adam betrayed Him, He didn't walk away. He said, I've got a remedy. It's going to take some time, but we're going to work this out. He, he was there in man's failure. He was there at man's worst. And I want to tell you, even at your worst, God has not walked away. He's not abandoned you. He's a father that loves you. And he's got more faith in you than you've yet mustered up in yourself. And so I just want to really encourage you to not give up on yourself and not give up on your Heavenly Father. And, and you know, not only is he there at our worst, but he's there to celebrate our successes, just as he did with Jesus. Uh, if you'll remember when Jesus was baptized at the River Jordan by John, God the Father just couldn't hold it in any longer. He broke heaven as the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus and, and uh, as he was coming up out of the water. God the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Glory to God. I, I wonder how many times if we really had ears to hear, we would have heard that in life. Because uh, I, I believe your father rejoices over your success as your Heavenly Father. And, and uh, so that's why I endeavor to teach the Word of God as I do. I want my Heavenly Father to get a fair shake. I don't want people to base their opinions on my Father upon, you know, conjecture or, or what religion has taught. I want folks to allow God to speak to them for Himself as their Heavenly Father. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Uh, we need to listen to the Father. We need to listen to what He has to say to us through His Word and by His Holy Spirit and by the testimony of His Son, Jesus Christ. He, he loves you. He's committed to you. 
and, and that's why we tell everybody we can about his goodness praise god amen and, and so I, I just want to talk to you today a little bit more we've been talking about the believer's authority and, and uh, as we do that we're just going to enter into our teaching and today we're going to lay a little bit more of a scriptural foundation for an understanding of what authority we possess now let me go ahead and open up my notes here uh, over in Luke chapter 10 Jesus made a statement he was talking to his disciples and if you'll remember <clears throat> what preceded this was Jesus had sent forth the 70 and when they came back they were utterly amazed because even the devils were subject to them through the name of Jesus and Jesus said, you know, basically don't, don't, you know, that's good and, and well, but, you know, the bigger, bigger issue is your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You know, thank God that we do have power to take control in our lives and help others. Thank God for that. But, but thank God even more that we have life and we've got, we've got an eternity to look forward to that's worth living. Amen. And it's all by the grace of God in Christ Jesus. So Jesus was speaking over here and he said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Now last week we discussed this a little bit and I just want to refresh on it. When this word power was translated in the first instance, when Jesus said, I give unto you power, it's actually from the Greek word exousia, which translates more accurately authority. Authority is delegated power. In other words, Jesus said, I'm entrusting control to you when you come right down to it. He didn't say, I'm infusing you. Now, we are infused with power from on high by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told the disciples in, in Acts chapter 1 as he prepared to ascend to the throne. Uh, he, he told them that, that they would receive power, you know, to tarry in Jerusalem until they received the promise of the Father. And it was that they might receive the Holy Spirit and be empowered to be witnesses. Well, glory to God. Thank God for the bad. In this, this instance, he's given us license to use the power and the abilities entrusted to us. And he says, I give unto you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. In other words, he's saying, you have the authority. I have given you license to walk over the devil and all of his devices. It says over all the power. Now that word power in the second instance is ability. It's the Greek word dunamis, and it speaks of ability. And it's kind of interesting because the Greek word dunamis is the word that we most often associate with the power of God in believers, uh, and believers. And it speaks of an explosive power. <laughs> you know, the suddenlies of God. Uh, it talks about an explosive power. In fact, the word dynamis is the word from which our English word dynamite is derived. And, and do you know what that tells me? I mean, why would it attribute dynamis to the enemy? Because it's saying even the greatest degree of the adversary's ability is subject to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So he said, Behold, I give unto you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the ability of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. You don't need to be intimidated about the devil. I've been around some folks that when you started talking about the devil and, and speaking of him in a scriptural context, they, they'd get all nervous. They'd almost start biting their nails. In some cases they probably did because they were so intimidated in their fear of the enemy. But you don't need to fear an enemy that you know is defeated. And if you'll read your Bible, you'll see that surely he was defeated at the cross of Christ Jesus. Amen. So anyway, we, we can see here that Jesus delegated his authority to believers in this verse, and, and he's describing that. And listen to verse 20, he said, Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In other words, you, your names are written in the Lamb's book of life, and you've got an eternity to look forward to, an eternity that others should covet amen when we live as god would have us <laughs> now when we look at authority and think about it being delegated power we understand it when we compare it to the authority of a police officer in our modern society i'm so thankful for policemen i'm thankful for those that have have really put their lives literally on the line 
have been shot at in some instances, attacked. And, and today, I tell you, there's been an unprecedented attack upon authority in our world and in our nation. And it's no wonder in, in the last days we're told that lawlessness would abound. Well, we need to pray for our police officers. Are they all perfect? No, no more than you and I are. But you know what? We need to pray for them and we need to thank God for these men and women that are willing to sacrifice as much as they have for as little as they get. Thank God for police officers. I just thank God for a, a, a hedge of protection around everyone today and, and in the days to come that wears that uniform, that sports that badge. Uh, I just thank God for divine protection. I thank God for helping you to be keen and alert to any threat against yourself or against those that you're called to protect. And I thank the Lord for blessing your family and giving them peace as you go about your duties. Amen. You're a blessing to us, and I want you to understand that. We, we count ourselves blessed that you are in the service of this, this community, our, our state, and even our nation, those that have that jurisdiction. God bless you. God keep you. And God encourage you. Because I believe there's more with you than are against you. The ones that may be against you might be loud. But you know what? We're in the closet. We're on our knees. And we're standing with you. And we're standing for you. And I believe that's going to go a lot further yes. than a lot of loud mouths that really don't know what they're saying. Amen. And I'm praying for people's eyes to be open. I'm so thankful I was raised with a a family that respected law enforcement. I've got family that's in law enforcement, family that's retired from it, and we're so thankful for them. We've seen up and expresses his authority. The person that's driving that truck knows that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, is standing behind that officer. At least they should be. I'm praying they'll get on board. Amen. <clears throat> and so it's it's understanding what stands behind that officer, not necessarily what physical strength he lacks. It's understanding the authority has been delegated to him to exercise in those instances. And that's the same with us. You know, there's times we may not feel like much, but it doesn't negate the fact that the greater one is within us. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And God is in you, working to will and to do of his good pleasure. And his good pleasure, believe it or not, is to use your mouth and your authority to stop the adversary in his tracks. In fact, you know, there's a lot of preachers that all they want to talk about is judgment. Judgment's coming. But if God had his way, those preachers would be on their face before him, pleading that judgment would be withheld. Because God himself, God himself said that mercy rejoices over judgment. In fact, over in, in Peter's epistles, he talked about how, you know, the reason the Lord tarries is he's waiting for folks to come in. Aren't you glad that God waited on you? Yeah. <laughs> I, listen, I want to go back to heaven. I've been there once. I want to go back as much as anybody's ever been there. I really do. But I don't want to go alone. And, and, and I, if there's hope of reaching just one more, I'm willing to stay. How about you? But you know what? It's not just being here physically. It's understanding and walking in the context of our sonship and the authority that affords us. Amen. That makes us effective in reaching our world. One of the things that we need to understand is that with authority comes responsibility. They're, they're intertwined and they're inseparable. Uh, for example, in, in the situation with a policeman, when a, when a policeman uh, receives his badge, he takes an oath. And, and he is called to certain standards to, which he's bound to uphold. And if he violates those standards, then he'll be prosecuted or terminated. Amen? Terminated in terms of his, his job being taken from him. Right? Why? Because there's a, a, a responsibility that goes with that authority. Uh, look back, if you would, very quickly to, um, oh, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to use my laptop like an a iPad, and it doesn't work that way. Go back to Genesis, if you would, Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, we find um, God scheming and dreaming about his creation. <laughs> it, it says over here in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. Now, understand this, God planned this creation. We're jumping in at the point that he executed it, but, but 
He planned this creation. We read Genesis and we think everything happened like that, but God is in eternity. And, and, and you know, folks start thinking about that. Well, what are we going to do for eternity? We're going to have a blast is what we're going to do because the devil ain't going to be there. He's not going to be tormenting those we love or afflicting them in any way. God's going to be there as our Father, and, and we're going to experience his love firsthand without interruption and without any kind of interference. Amen. It's just going to be so incredible. And I've shared this before, and I'll share it again very quickly. But years ago, I overdosed on, on uh, some prescription medication. And the effect of that medication was that it stopped my heart and it paralyzed my, my diaphragm. Well, if you can't breathe and your heart can't beat, well, what happens to you? Yeah, you die. And I literally died. Uh, they estimated I was dead for upwards of 10, perhaps as much as 15 minutes. In other words, without any respiration. And, and as the uh, <clears throat> people that came with the ambulance, the EMTs and what have you, uh, ministered to my physical frame, I, I had left my body. And, and they struggled to get me resuscitated. And, and uh, I often share this, and I'm so thankful for Brother Hubert Robinson. He was a Bradenham police officer. Maybe this explains a little bit of my fondness for law officers as well. But they were about to give up on me and call my time of death. And Hubert said, no, you're going to give it another try. And they gave it another try and, and got a pulse and transported me to the hospital. Well, during all this, I had left my body. And I went to heaven. And I saw some loved ones that had preceded me in, in, in uh, death, including my grandmother, my paternal grandmother. And I was there. And we had a conversation. And... And the last thing I remember was when I really realized what was going on. I remember at first thinking, I'm in heaven? How can I be in heaven? And I was reminded as a child I had received Jesus. And I immediately thought, but I sinned. I lived such a wicked life because I was chasing women and women were chasing me, believe it or not. I was a lot better looking back then. <laughs> but anyway, I was chasing women. They were chasing me and I was drinking and I was doing every drug I could find. And here I was, I overdosed and Surely, if you, you know, if you commit suicide, you're going straight to hell, right? Wrong, wrong. The reason you go to heaven is because of Jesus. Yeah. Uh, uh, plain and simple. And, and as I recalled that, as I recalled the wicked life I had lived, I, I, I can remember, well, you know, the blood of Jesus prevailed. Glory to God, the blood of Jesus prevailed. And all I did was ask him into my heart as a little child. And, and, you know, I can remember at the last moment thinking, well, I'd like to see Jesus. And I was immediately drawn. I was standing with my grandmother underneath this most beautiful tree in the lushest of green grass. And, and uh, we were next to a little creek area. And, and, and there were family members. There. there Actually, when I approached her, there were people all around her that I didn't recognize. And I'd start to ask Granny who they were, and I'd immediately know. You know, just like the... Mount of Transfiguration. The disciples had never met Moses or Elijah, but the moment they saw him, they knew who they were because they had a little foretaste of the glory we call heaven. And, and so uh, that's what happened with me. And it's so funny because my grandmother would want to answer me, but before she could answer me, I'd know who they were. And they were uh, family members from generations gone by. Many had lived and died before I was ever conceived. And, and yet, uh, you know, I knew them in heaven. You'll know in heaven even as you're known. And, and I knew them in heaven, and they knew me. They knew me. Isn't that interesting? Well, anyway, I can remember thinking, well, I want to see Jesus. And the last thing I remember was I was drawn from that place over this wall where the gates of heaven were. And, and into and, and the last thing I remember was approaching the presence of the Lord. Next thing I knew, and it brings brings tears to my eyes remembering this it was so sweet next thing i knew i was back in my body I, I i've always surmised had i spent any time with jesus at that point i never would have come back i just don't think i could have torn myself away from from his embrace and my embrace of him at that point and there was work to be done because see back when i was i, I tell folks that don't know jesus that the reason I want them to know Jesus is that heaven just wouldn't be the same without them. 
God created you for heaven. It's the devil that tried to sidetrack you and take you on a detour away from God. God still wants you. You know, you might be like me, and you might think, as I did in that moment in heaven, but I live so wickedly. Yeah, and there's a reason for that. You fell prey to the adversary and his, his seduction, his devices. But God never, never lessened his love for you. At your worst, he gave his best. While we were yet sinners, God commendeth his love for us, or toward us, we're told in, in uh, Romans 5, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loves you more than life itself. He doesn't love you because of your successes. He doesn't hate you because of your failures. He loves you because he's God. And he sees in you things that you're yet to discover. It's going to take us eternity to realize any degree of the magnitude of what he's invested within us. That's why we need to get started now. That's why we're teaching as we do from God's word about your authority as a believer amen so with authority comes responsibility and let me get on back over to our text in genesis chapter one it says oh i, I didn't finish did I? I the reason i brought up my experience and my my venture to heaven was this that that to me it just took place so quickly you know heaven is eternal there's there's no clocks in heaven that i'm aware of i didn't see because <laughs> they're irrelevant you're living in a place of timelessness <laughs> and a place of eternity. And it was so funny because I, 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 next thing I knew, I'm coming to in my hospital bed. And, and uh, you know, there's so much more to that I don't have time to share today. But I came to in my hospital bed and I just assumed it was the next morning. But years later, I was talking to my wife, Robin. We were driving somewhere with mom and dad. Actually, I was in the back seat with Robin and, and uh, trying to fend her off. You know how those women can be with us guys. But anyway, and, uh, we were just back there talking and and uh, I was talking about when I'd gone to heaven and how, you know, the next morning after I had overdosed when I woke up, my mom said, wait a minute. She said it wasn't the next morning. What? See, when, when they told my family what had happened, they, they advised them not to put me on life support because of the length of time my brain had been without oxygen. But I had been operating in a brainless mode for years, you know, almost a decade at that point. And so I'd become adapted to that. No, I'm just teasing. I, I laid me down and I slept, but I wait for the Lord sustained me. And so anyway, here I am and we're riding along and I made that statement. Mom said, no, son, it wasn't the next morning. You were in a coma in the hospital for three days, three nights. <laughs> Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> Remember that guy named Jonah? And then there was Jesus. Well, anyway, uh, you know, it, it kind of shook me. I didn't realize it had been that long. But see, just that brief little visit in heaven was three days in length. And I, I had no awareness of that kind of time going by. Met a lot of people. <laughs> had a good time and got to come back. Amen. Well, over here in Genesis 1, it, it tells us that so God created man in his image. In verse 27, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. I'm so glad that he, he went ahead, even before he described the, um, uh, you know, the, the process of Eve's creation. Before he got to that point, he's, he's already got her in mind as he's speaking here. In other words, he did not equip Adam any better or her any less than one another. He gave them the same resources. So God blessed them. God said unto them, be fruitful. Amen. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now, isn't that interesting? And that's a side thought. But you can't replenish the earth unless it's been plenished at one point. <laughs> right? And so, you know, a lot of people get worked up about fossils that seem to be older than the Genesis record of creation. Well, there was a creation that existed before. In fact, uh, Jesus, in, in our text over there in Luke chapter 10, as we read the surrounding passages in the past, we discovered uh, that, that Jesus talked about seeing Satan fall from heaven. He was struck down, and, and uh, it, it was he was struck down to earth is ultimately what we're told in other verses lend uh, credence to that but anyway um, it, it says down here that they were to replenish the earth 
that implies that there was a creation before Adam and Eve that existed on this earth until judgment fell upon it. Well, so he said, replenish the earth. But look at the next thing he said. It's not just up to us to bear children, but it's up to us to subdue this environment that we are placed in to live in. Amen. So he said, replenish the earth. God doesn't leave his children to chance. He has deliberately equipped us. And if we would read his word, he would instruct us as to take charge in this life. He wants us to walk in victory. He wants us to bring everything else into subjection rather than find that we're living life at the mercy of a creation that's corrupt who has a ruler who's fallen. And, and so he says, replenish the earth and subdue it. And listen to this, have dominion. Dominion's another name for authority. Dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So even from the outset, God had delegated to Adam and to Eve authority over every other aspect of this creation. Plant, animal, vegetable. Amen. didn't matter. So in the temptation, Adam was in possession of everything necessary to prevail over that temptation and maintain God's divine order in this creation, but he didn't. Now, when you think about that, since Adam had the authority, who was responsible for the fall of humanity? Who was responsible for every grave that's ever been dug? Because, see, death entered in through sin, and Adam's the one who sinned. Uh, who, who was responsible for for it becoming necessary for there to be doctors and hospitals. You know, there won't be doctors. Well, there will be doctors in heaven, but they won't have to practice anymore. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. I don't want to say doctors don't go to heaven because they do. I'm so thankful for saved doctors. But do you understand what I mean? They won't be needed there in terms of their physical practice uh, because there won't be any, any disease or sickness or or infirmity in heaven <laughs> glory to God when you get to heaven you're going to be more alive than you've ever been uh, you're going to be free of pain glory to God amen well <laughs> anyway so the, the, the suffering of humanity was not God's responsibility it was never people say well why does God let, let children suffer why does God let people experience the, the torment and the misery and the, the anguish and the pain of death and cancer and disease and affliction and why are some born disabled? It's not God's fault, saints. It's really not. It, it's the adversary's fault and it's Adam that gave him opportunity. But Jesus told us that he didn't come to this earth to destroy men's lives. Rather, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And I believe that was first and foremost God's creation of humanity. But secondarily, he wanted us restored to that position of superiority within creation so that we could live a victorious and a glorious life. Amen? Now think about it a minute. Religion has forever and continues yet to this day to give men excuse for failures. God gives us wisdom and grace to succeed. That's what authority is about. God wants you to know that when the adversary attacks, you've got resources to withstand him. Do you know that we're told to be sober, to be vigilant, because our adversary, the devil, is stalking about like a roaring lion. He's seeking whom he may devour. You know what? He can't devour just anybody and everybody. The only ones he can't devour, though, are those who know and are willing through faith to exercise their rights as God's children. I'm so thankful for the authority that I have enjoyed and the privileges and the opportunity it has afforded me in life. And I wouldn't know about this except the Lord has taught me and brought others into my life that have instructed me further in the reality of my authority as his son. I, I, you know, I'm so glad that when, 
when in situations that have occurred, uh, I've seen others had to give up and, and bow to defeat. I'm so glad for the grace I've been afforded to stand. We, we just this last year had a situation where our grandbaby was attacked physically and as his mom and daddy held him, we were, we were on the phone with Mark and Christina and, and thank God for Mark and Christina. They know the word of God. They understand their authority and they understand also the power of agreement and prayer. And, and uh, we were, Robin and I were off, we were on vacation and and they were with us actually, but they were at the cabin we had rented and we were across town running some errands and doing some things uh, just together. And, and Victoria called us on the phone panicked because uh, our, our grandson, Braden, was struggling to breathe. And, and as we prayed with them, he, uh, you know, it seemed like he was getting worse and worse. And I told him, see, we're not opposed to doctors. I said, call emergency immediately. I said, call for an ambulance. And Christine already had done that, but she also called us and had, had Victoria call us. And as Mark held him, you could hear, you know, that they were really being challenged. But as the, he held Brayden, Brayden suddenly just went limp and turned blue. He wasn't breathing anymore. And, and I can remember as Rob, I, I, no, see, we didn't know in the natural. I'm so thankful to the Lord that we've got answers. We've got solutions. I don't want excuses. I don't want excuses so I can watch people I love suffer loss like that. And I can remember the unction of the Holy Ghost rising up big within me. As I spoke over that phone and I commanded death to loose its hold off that baby in the name of Jesus. And just within an instant, that baby began. Now, Mark was doing the same thing. You know, the devil, the devil picked a lot bigger fight than he ever had any idea of picking. And, and, and we, we, we refused to let that baby die. Yeah. Amen. Well, going back to Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give unto you authority over all the ability of the devil. If we've got it, we must use it. If we don't use it, we can't continue to blame God for our neglect or the results of it. Amen? And listen, you might sit there, and I'm not saying that to condemn you. I'm really not. There was a time I suffered losses that could have prevent, been prevented had I known. I can't change that, but I can change now. And there are people in my life now I still don't want to lose uh, prematurely. <coughs> If I had my way ever, probably. But, you know, you understand what I'm saying. Amen? And, and and you can't change the past. Some of you have lost loved ones that are dear to you. And my heart breaks for you. I know what that's like. I've lost loved ones yeah. that I couldn't help. Yeah. But there are people you can help if you learn. Yeah. And it's so important. Listen, I started last week by talking about how if it's not practical, it isn't spiritual. The truth and the teaching surrounding the believer's authority is so much more practical than you realize. Braden's a healthy, growing little boy today, and, and that wouldn't have been. All we would have done is had a funeral and, and celebrated what could have been and spoken of the potential that was lost. But instead, we're watching him grow, and we're going to see him realize that potential. And we're going to watch him grow up, and I believe that little boy is probably going to be a preacher. I, I, I don't care what he is. I know he's alive. Yeah. And I want to tell you that the, the Jesus in you, if, he, if you'll just turn him loose, if you'll learn who you are and you learn what's yours and what you have, you can live life so much bigger, so much better, and give God so much more glory. It doesn't give God glory when people make excuses. It gives Him glory when they receive His benefits and blessings. The psalmist said, and I'm going to close with this, he said, Bless the Lord, all my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Bless the Lord, all my soul, who forgiveth all mine iniquity and healeth all mine diseases. Do you have a need in your life today? Is there something in your life that you have sought the Lord for to bring remedy. Maybe it's healing or maybe it's deliverance from some oppressive stronghold in your life. And maybe you've been asking God to do something about it. Let's do something about it ourselves today. I want you to, to just shut your eyes a moment as I pray here in just a moment. And I'm going to speak to strongholds in your life. 
And, and you know what I'm going to believe? I'm going to believe they're broken, but I'm also going to believe the Lord's going to make w himself wisdom to you. He, he uh, you know, he called his people out of Egypt, but they had to walk out. He delivered them, but they had to walk out. And I believe the Lord is going to be made wisdom to you to help you walk free as we exercise dominion over those things that have sought to hold you as a snare and prevent you from God's best. And those of you that need healing, instead of waiting for God to do something, I want you to rejoice in what he's done. He sent his son, and his son bore stripes upon his body that would afford you healing. Jesus, we're told, already bare our sickness and carried our diseases. By his stripes ye were healed. It's already done in spirit. So we're going to take hold of it. And what I want you to do after we pray is I want you to start thanking God that you're healed. That you're not going to listen to your body anymore. You're not going to listen to the devil anymore. You're going to rejoice in the word of God that's unchanging and forever settled. If you'll do that, I believe you can walk in healing today, right now. Father, we just thank you right now. And on behalf of my brothers and sisters, those that have been tormented through oppression and even for guilt. Oh, the devil's so wicked. He, he offers and, and seduces people into temptation to sin, and then he immediately attacks them for having accepted his offer. Lord, we take authority over that guilt. We, we thank you that it's resolved because you forgive all our iniquities. Glory to God. The forgiveness is there in the blood of Jesus, and we thank you for that forgiveness. We thank you for a greater awareness of your mercy than their failure rising into prominence in their thoughts and in their lives. Father, we pray for those that have been afflicted in body. We command healing from the top of their heads. That anointing, it's going forth. Even as I'm praying right now, I, I can sense that anointing going forth as I speak. And it's coming into your body right now as I'm talking. From the top of your head to the sole of your toe, the anointing of God, the power of God, We've got the authority to release it, and so we do so. Right now, in Jesus' name. Because it's that anointing that destroys that yoke, whether it be bondage to sin or infirmity and sickness. Father, we thank you for healing. We command all symptoms to the contrary to dissipate and be gone, be cast into the sea. In Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you for those that are listening today. Maybe, maybe they've never heard the good news. The good news is that you loved them so much that you sent Jesus. And if they'll but confess him as Lord, they can be saved. Lord, we confess you as our master, Jesus. We thank the Father for raising you from the dead. And the word of God tells us that with the heart we believe unto righteousness, with the mouth we confess unto salvation. We thank you, Father God that Jesus is our Lord risen from the grave, and that we will spend eternity with you in Jesus' precious name. We're saved. Glory to God. Amen. Now don't feel yourself to see if you're saved. We're going to base our belief on God's word. Our faith is in him, not our feelings. Amen. Glory to God. Just start thanking God you're saved. If you've never said that before, thank God. Father, I just thank you. Behold what manner of love you've bestowed upon me that I would be called your son. Yes. Glory to God. You're his son if you made that confession. You're his daughter. And you're healed if you prayed and agreed with us today. You're set free from bondage. God loves you. God loves you. Glory to God and we do too. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. We just